Hey everybody, this video is going to deal with measurement in science. The big question being, how do you measure? Remember that in the sciences, including chemistry, we often had, have standardized methods for taking measurements. The big questions here, what tools do you use to take measurements? How do you take accurate measurements with those tools? And how do you represent the number that describes your measurement? First, we'll take a look at some of the basic tools. Think of this as your most basic chemistry toolkit. If, if you were to go to a hardware store, you might buy a tape measure, a screwdriver, maybe a hammer. Those are your basic most tools. That's what we're looking at here. Notice these first two. We have a graduated cylinder and a burette, and these hold volumes of material. So we say that for these tools, we're measuring volume, that's our quantity for these tools. Units that we may use include milliliters, abbreviated as lowercase m, uppercase l. Centimeters cubed, that's a three-dimensional centimeter happens to be the same as a milliliter. And liters, abbreviated as an uppercase L, liters happen to be the base unit in the metric system for measuring volume. We'll talk about that soon. Next, we have what appears to be a ruler, and that's exactly what it is. Rulers, of course, of course measuring length. Examples of length include meters, centimeters, abbreviated CM, and kilometers, abbreviated KM. Next we have balances, which measure mass, the amount of matter in an object. Mass can be measured using multiple units, including grams, kilograms, that's kg, and milligrams, mg. We also have a thermometer, which as you probably know, is a way to measure temperature. In chemistry, we'll be using primarily two systems of measurement for temperature. They include the Kelvin scale, abbreviated with a K, and the Celsius scale, abbreviated as C. They actually are the same scale as we'll see, it's just that they have different starting points. We'll get into that soon enough. One tool that you'll be using quite often this year in chemistry is the graduated cylinder. Chances are you've used one of these before. Remember, it's a tool used to measure volume. Um, on this slide, you'll see the technique for using a graduated cylinder. Once it's filled with a certain volume, you should set it on your lab table. You should bend down so that you're at eye level with what's called the meniscus. Remember, the meniscus is the curved surface of the liquid in the container, and that's due to adhesion. Um, and then you want to record your volume at the midpoint of the meniscus. Notice here the eye is pointing to this little spot right here. That's the meniscus, and that's what you want to read when you're looking at the volume in a graduated cylinder. We will also see that when we're doing measurements, there are actually two very broad and basic types. One is exact, the other is inexact. An exact measurement, well, you have an example right here. When you look at that, how many shapes are there? How many boxes? Yeah, no question there. There are four boxes. We call this an exact or a discrete measurement. It's any measurement where you can be absolutely certain as to what the value actually is. You know without any shadow of doubt that there are four boxes here. With an inexact measurement, you can be mostly or pretty sure as to what the value is, but not exactly. Here's an example. Let's zoom in, and if I were to ask you to record the length of this green line, you might say, well, that's about 9.6, and that looks about right. If you look here, we come past the 9.5 line, and we're at about the 9.6. OK, 
Okay, so is that exact? Well, not really, and here's why. If you were to zoom in even closer on that 9.6 line, you would notice a few things. First off, you don't know the exact end point or the center point of the green mark. You know, once whoever was drawing that green line, you know, the end of that line may not have a perfect end point. Likewise, the ruler itself may have very, very slight manufacturing defects. Notice the gap here between 9.3 and 9.4 is, is a little more narrow than the other gaps. So that's a slight defect that's going to throw off the measurement of the ruler. Now it's not going to throw it off enough to you know, make it so we can't use that tool. We can still get fairly reliable measurements, but we would cons consider this an inexact measurement. So the second type of measurement is an inexact or continuous measurement. Inexact because, again, you can be fairly certain what the value is, but you can never know exactly, down to the very, very last digit, what exactly the value is. Most of the measurements we're going to make in chemistry are inexact or continuous measurements. Whenever you're measuring with a scale, with a ruler, or a graduated cylinder or balance. These are inexact measurements. Here are some general rules when you're recording a measurement with some device in lab. First off, the number of significant digits is very important. What this number of figures is, it's the number of digits that you think is correct uh, when you're taking the measurement. It includes any numbers you can be sure of as well as one estimated digit. And we'll look at some examples shortly. When you record measurements, they, they should show or reflect the smallest division of your measuring tool. If you are less sure, read to just above or below the smallest division of your device. Here's an example. In this beaker, the smallest division, meaning the value of each line, is 10 milliliters. So we would read to a volume of plus or minus 1 milliliter. 1, of course, is going to be our estimated digit. So what are two possible correct readings for the volume of liquid in this speaker? Well, we know it's above 40, but we know it's below 50 based on the lines. So we'll put 4. 4 is what we call our certain digit. It's a number that we can be sure of. We know, we can be fairly sure that this volume is 40 milliliters. The next digit in the ones place is our estimated digit. Remember that idea from just a minute ago. You need to have one estimated digit. So estimates here, good estimates would be to say that it's 46 milliliters. I think 47 milliliters would also, that's an M there, 47 milliliters would also be an acceptable measurement. How many significant digits are in these readings? We have two, because those are the digits that are recorded as this measurement. So we have two significant digits here. Here's another example. Here's a graduated cylinder. The smallest division is worth one milliliter. So we would read to a volume of plus or minus 0 0.1 milliliters. And the 0.1, that tenths place, is going to be our estimated digit. So two possible correct readings. Well, we know that it's above 35. Here's 30. I'm sorry. We know it's above 36. Here's 36 right here. But it's not quite 37. So we'll say 36 and 36. And then our estimated digit, well, one good estimate would probably be 0.5, and another good estimate would be 0.4. So 36.5 milliliters or 36.4 milliliters, both acceptable readings for this graduated cylinder. How many significant digits? Well, each has three, as you can see, 365 and 364. 
Here's another example, a puree, which is um, like a graduated cylinder, only uh, much more accurate. Uh, the smallest division here, if you notice, we have 21 and we have 20. So each line then is actually worth 0 0.1. So that means we're going to read to a volume of plus or minus 0 0.01. The hundredths place here is going to be our estimated digit. So two possible correct readings. Well, you read down 20, 20.1, 20 20.2. So we know that it's more than 20.3, but it's not quite 20.4. So we'll put 20.3, and those are digits that we can be sure of. We know that it's more than 20.3. Now, looking here, estimating good estimates would be 20.37, milliliters or 20.38 milliliters. How many significant digits? Well, we have four. Three here, the two, zero, two, zero, three, and seven, and over here the two, the zero, the three, and the eight. For balances, the fortunate thing for you this year is that we're going to use electronic balances. Basically, that's a balance where you put the object on the balance pan, and then a readout, a display, a digital display, gives you the mass. Quite simply, when you read a digital balance, you must include all digits, all digits, <laughs> including zeros that are on the display. So this mass, what would you, how would you record it? Quite simply, 109.80. And that zero is important. You must include that final zero. That's the computer's way, the computer being the balance. It's its computer's way of estimating. That's its estimated digit. So any digits on that display, you must record. How many significant digits here? Well, we have five. The one, the zero, the nine, the eight, and that last zero five significant digits. Our last topic here is to think about determining scale. Really, that's a fancy way of saying what is each line worth on your measuring tool. Let me write that down for you. Again, that's what is each line worth on the measuring tool. Now, a number of you will probably be able to do this intuitively because you've been doing it in your science classes probably since elementary school. Others, if you're not quite sure, consider the, 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 these three easy steps you can use to determine scale. Let's take a look. First step, you want to figure out the difference between the numbered lines. That means a line with a number next to it. So here we have a 50, here we have a 60, and think about it. Why aren't the rest of the lines numbered? Well, it would be hard to read that instrument. It's a design thing. So what's the difference here? Well, 60 minus 50, oh, that's pretty bad. 50, or 60 minus 50, that's a difference of 10 milliliters. Okay, first step, difference between numbered lines. Next step, count the number of divisions that are made between the two numbered lines. So not the number of lines here, no, but the number of divisions. So here's one, here's a second one, third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine. We have ten divisions between the 50 and the 60 mark. So how many divisions? We have ten divisions. Now this is going to be different depending on the tool that you're using. Here, it just so happens that we have a difference of 10 as well as 10 divisions. Okay, that's your second step. On to the third one. Your final step here in determining scale is that you're going to divide that difference from step 1 by the divisions in step 2. So here, we have a difference of 10 milliliters divided by 10 divisions equals one unit per mark, and the unit here, of course, being milliliters. So in this particular de uh, measuring device, each line is worth one milliliter, and we would call that the scale 
of that graduated scale under scale of one milliliter. So if you, and that's an M, my apologies. So again, if you're not sure of what the scale is, you can use that easy method to figure it out. Okay, good job everybody. At this point you are done with this screencast. Yay! Um, what you should do is make sure that you've filled in the packet that I gave you to go along with this. Uh, if you need to go back and view other parts, feel free to do that. And this video will be up on Moodle uh, for the remainder of the school year, as a matter of fact. Uh, in class, you should be prepared to take a short practice quiz when you come in. And then you're going to circulate to a number of learning stations to actually use this material. Likewise, the ideas here are things you'll be using all school year. Okay, see you in class.